Good morning and welcome to our service. Steve Utley, pastor at Cedar Grove United Methodist Church in Marion and Pittsburgh United Methodist Church in Pittsburgh. Glad to have you joining us today for our service. This, by the way, is the founder of Methodism, John Wesley's birthday today. He was born in 1703. 1703, that was some time ago, 
but this is his birthday today. In the way of <coughs> my uh, sermon title today is Joy, and it's taken for the first few verses, 1 through 11, and then 21 and 22 of Philippians chapter 1. Want to spend a little bit of time on the book of Philippians, and that is where we'll be spending time today. I've come across an interesting thing this week, uh, reading, and I just want to share this with you. It'll just take a couple of minutes. I found it in uh, a book called Ministry in the Image of God by Steve Siemens, who is a professor in theology at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, and it's a book on the Holy Trinity. And I'm going to read you this. Um, he says, Luke implies that Christ's earthly ministry didn't end with his death, resurrection, and ascension to God's right hand. That's why he is writing a second book, Acts, to tell the story of the ongoing ministry of Jesus through his apostles, as biblical expositor John Stott explains. Luke's first two verses are therefore extremely significant. It is no exaggeration to say that they set Christianity apart from all other religions. These regard their founder as having completed his ministry during his lifetime. Luke says Jesus only began his, for after the resurrection, ascension, and gift of the Spirit, he continued his work first and foremost through the unique foundation ministry of the chosen apostles, and subsequently through the post-apostolic church of every period and place. Jesus' earthly ministry, therefore, didn't end when he returned to his Father in heaven. Through his body, the church, it merely assumed a different shape. The ministry we have entered is meant to be an extension of his. In fact, all authentic Christian ministry participates in Christ's ongoing ministry. Ministry is essentially about our joining Christ in His ministry, not His joining us in ours. So much of our stress and burnout is, a, is the direct result of our failure to grasp this basic truth about ministry. We are carrying burdens that were never designed to carry, burdens that Christ never intended for us to carry. Instead of following Christ the leader, we wrongly assume the burden of leadership ourselves. No wonder we collapse under its weight. Understanding whose ministry it can be, tremendously liberating Jesus' words, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Apostle Paul, the writer of Philippians and several other books, I believe maybe understood this many, many years ago. Uh, a few things about the Apostle Paul. Uh, this was written uh, around A.D. 60 from a Roman prison. This was one of his prison epistles. The Apostle Paul... Uh, a very unique individual. He was born in the dispersion period of history. He was raised in Tarsus, and Tarsus was a very, very big, uh, booming uh, city. Uh, tens of thousands of people. Uh, they done a lot of, spent a lot of time. It was just a huge place. There was had education, and there was a whole industry, a bunch of, of different 
things going on in Tarsus, and that was his hometown and where he grew up. He was an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he was a rabbi. Uh, he was bilingual. He uh, spoke fluently Hebrew and Greek. Um, he was a very unique person. Uh, Paul took pride in being a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And the one interesting thing that I, I read along the way about Paul, this says, For the Christian world, however, the most significant thing is that this first century Greco-Roman citizen and Jewish rabbi became the most outstanding Christian preacher and theologian of all time. That says very much about Paul, and we know according to tradition that Paul uh, was put to death by having his head, head removed. So he, he went through very much. He had a ministry of some 30 years, done a lot of writing and a lot of uh, good for the cause of Christ. But I believe that he understood uh, whose mission it was. It was Christ's mission, and he was just joining to be a part of Christ's mission. A little interesting caption here about a summary of the, the local church. I found it says that a local church is an assembly of professing believers in the Lord Jesus Christ living in one locality, meeting together in Jesus' name for baptism, holy communion, worship, praise, prayer, fellowship, testimony, the ministry of the word, discipline, and the furtherance of the gospel. I thought that is why we have, that's why local churches are what they are and what they're doing, but that was summed up in a, a little neat shell about the local church. Uh, this particular section of scripture, Philippians chapter 1, uh, many say that the book of Philippians was Paul's happiest letter. An interesting thing, Paul did not tell how we can be happy or how to be happy. He was just happy. And there was a reason for that. None of his circumstances contribute to his happiness as he wrote from a jail cell. Philippians was written to a group of Christians who had been close to his heart. The key verse in Philippians chapter 1 is verse 21, and it reads, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The occasion for the epistle was to acknowledge a gift from the church at Philippi brought to him from Epaphroditus. Uh, he was very, very grateful for that because in Paul's mind, he viewed that as when they brought this financial gift to him, not only that was one little tiny part of it, but Paul viewed that as their way of, and this had been going on since the very beginning of his ministry, Paul viewed that as them joining in and becoming partners in the ministry of Christianity. And so he was exceedingly glad for that because he knew that it was a partnership between the people who had been praying for him and then sent him the gift, and they had joined in and become a part of his ministry. <clears throat> Paul lived uh, and ministered under five emperors uh, from Octavius, who was uh, named Caesar Augustus, uh, down to, to Nero, 
he was arrested uh, under Nero's uh, reign, and Nero, it should be called Nero's reign of terror. Uh, Nero was a very unusual person. He uh, saw to it that his, his own mother was killed and then two of his wives. So he was a very ruthless. He started reigning when he was about 17, and uh, he was a very unusual person. So Paul's, for Paul's 30-some year ministry to end up and have it, Nero, an emperor, uh, was a very not good thing for Paul. <coughs> there are several themes uh, in the book of Philippians. One is joy, uh, except this joy talked about in Philippians chapter 1 was the kind that no matter what the circumstances were, Paul was a joyous person because, and the reason for that was he had the people behind him supporting him, praying for him, bringing him gifts. So that was one of the reasons for his joy. And then he come to the point we see in verse 21 where if he lives on and continues to do the work of ministry or if his life is taken, he is going to have joy and keep joy in his heart and mindset either way no matter what happens. Joy, uh, one of the Greek roots for joy is Cairo and it means I rejoice. Those, that term I rejoice or those two words I rejoice is found 16 times in the four chapters. Another theme was the Christian mind. Mind is the way a person thinks, feels, and acts, our, our attitude, our outlook, our values. So really, the Christian mind should be totally different from the mind of an unbeliever. Another theme in Philippians is the word fellowship, koinonia, fellowship in the gospel, fellowship in the spirit, fellowship in the sufferings. A way to sum that up would be partakers, and Paul mentions that in this text, and that was one thing that brought him great joy, that the people praying for him and trying to minister to him had become partners in the ministry. <clears throat> Read Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. So Paul introduces himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. Servant meant bond slave, totally at his master's disposal. Paul says that he and Timothy are the property of their master, Jesus Christ. And that is not in a bad way. Paul says that he and Timothy are the property of his, their master, Jesus Christ. He is doing the Lord's bidding. Timothy was probably his closest associate. And whenever it come to the end of Paul's life and Paul's last uh, book that he wrote was Second Timothy. And during that time period, uh, after some 30 years of ministry, he knew that his time was soon going to be coming to an end and that he would be meeting the one that he met very clearly and plainly that day on the road to Damascus <coughs> whenever he had the encounter with Jesus. And so he knew during the writing of Second Timothy process that his time was, was almost done. But Timothy was his closest associate. He was a resident of Lystra, and he joined Paul on his second mission, missionary journey. There's a word in there, in that verse, saints. 
uh, servants or saints. Saints is Christians, set apart ones, holy ones, God's people, a covenant term from the Old Testament referring back to Israel to the holy people of God. Saints in the Old Testament meant angelic beings, but uh, the standard opening for a letter like Philippians, uh, there, was, there was three elements to a standard opening. One was the writer's identification, and Paul done that, said Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. Another uh, standard opening part of it was the recipient of the letter, and he puts that in there, to all God's people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And he also, uh, they put a greeting or a well-wishing. And Paul's greeting and well-wishing is verse 2, which says, Grace and peace, two things, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, of course, is God's free, unmerited favor, which is the basis of our salvation. And then peace is the result of salvation, the fruit of reconciliation. And the word peace denotes wholeness, soundness, prosperity, especially in spiritual things. He's talking about the prosperity of spiritual things. And Paul prayed because these people that he wrote to at Philippi had became very, very close to his heart. And so Paul, in his uh, greeting and well-wishing, was that grace and peace would rest upon and it would bless the readers at Philippi. <coughs> There's a few key points uh, to name in verses 1 and 2. Uh, Paul wrote that he is a saint was positionally set apart by God. He is faithful based on the fact that he believes in Christ. He is the object of God's grace, experiencing salvation by the unmerited favor of God, and he experiences God's peace, being at peace with God and enjoying a sense of wholeness. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. So part of Paul's joy, and this is significant to point out, part of Paul's joy is the fact that he had a thankful heart. He says, I thank God for all the remembrance I have of you, talking to the people at Philippi, one pleasant memory causes him to give thanks. So he is thankful for those people who were still supporting them even though he was in a jail cell. Verse 4, And all my prayers for all of you I always pray with joy. Paul prayed regularly with joy, not out of sadness or not out of uh, a have to, but he prayed with joy for the people. And verse 5 gives the reason, one of the reasons. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul was complimenting them in verse 5 for sharing in his ministry, being part of his ministry. Verse 6 Philippians 1, 6 is one of those famous verses. There are several famous verses in the book of Philippians. But I remember hearing this all of my life, and I'm sure that there were a lot of songs written about verse 6. It reads, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
God began the work. God will continue the work of grace in them until the day Christ Jesus returns. There was a word in another version in there that they put in verse 6, perform, which perform is to bring something to its intended goal. This goal is conforming to the image of God until Christ comes again. And that is our goal. And another couple of verses that helps out with that is Romans 12, 1 and 2. It gives us what our goal is to be conformed to the image of God. But part of Paul's joy and peace and everything that went along with that, and he prayed for the people at Philippi that those two important things would rest on them, grace and peace, because Paul understood that God began the work in him and that God would continue the work of grace until Jesus Christ returns again, or until, in Paul's situation, writing of Timothy, he knew that his time was soon going to be up. But, and as I said, I'm sure there are many songs written about verse 6. We can know that God began the work in us, and by grace and through faith, he is going to continue that work in us until Jesus comes again. Philippians 1.7, Paul is making a statement. And he says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. So Paul had a relationship with the people. <coughs> a few th words that help explain that is, that relationship between Paul and the people was one of gratitude, one of prayer, one of joy, partnership, confidence in the work of God, deep affection. They had become close to his heart. Those who support other Christians in ministry, our goal should be to strive to have that kind of a relationship to where we pray and we care for. Uh, we consider it them to be partners with us in our ministry. And that is one of the reasons and the sources of Paul's joy, even in unusual circumstances and difficult circumstances. He still had joy. Verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And that is putting it in, in the proper perspective. I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It was a spiritual bonding together. 9 says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. His goal and his plan and his encouraging for the people was that they would grow in the fear and knowledge and learn more about Jesus Christ and who he was. It says, this is my prayer that you, your love may abound more and more in knowledge. Ten, so that you may be able to. So he says, this is what is my goal for you all. And then verse 10, he gives the reason why. It says, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Christ, he mentions again about the day of Christ or until Jesus comes. Leaven filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. One reason 
for his peace that he had was his right relationship with God, and he considered that he had a right relationship with the people. When we are living right, that will have an effect on not only our relationship with our family, but the relationship of all of those around us. One more verse, Philippians 1.21, and this is the, probably the main theme of, these, of all of Philippians. Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and die is gain. Paul's attitude about life and death, whatever living he has done or yet will do, there is two points about that. One, Jesus Christ is the object, the motive, the inspiration, the goal of all that he does. And two, if he lives, he says, this is the fruit of my labor. And if he dies, that will be gain. So Paul says that death will be to his advantage as he will be in the presence of Jesus. Most importantly, this attitude accounts for the joy. So I guess basically what this is trying to say here is, and what he is trying to say, it is how we define joy and where our joy comes from. We can bring that up to 2020 and we can say no matter what the circumstances are around us, no matter what is going on, we can have joy and peace in our heart knowing that everything is okay between us and God and that we are, are ready and whether we this or that happens, we can still have joy and peace no matter the circumstances. And I know it's one thing to say that and it's something totally different to be able to carry it out. That is why we need to stick so close to our Bible and read and know our Bible and we need to pray. The, the Apostle Paul <coughs> started out everything with prayer. It wasn't the second thing he done or the third thing he done. He started with prayer. Verse 22, he says, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. So he had come to the point where no matter what's going on, no matter what happens tomorrow, I'm, I'm, it will be gain. It will be a win. He's, another way of saying it, he said it was a win-win situation. He was ready either way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for men like the Apostle Paul the one who became the greatest Christian preacher and theologian of all time over his 30-year ministry. Thank you that you had your hand on his life and we can know much more about who you are and what you mean to us by you having your hand on his life, guiding him in everything he done. Lord, we praise you today and thank you for your word, for your mercy and grace to us. Bless us this day. We ask this, Father, in your name. Amen.